what you had in the first case, where the three parties, the, the driver and the, the two sets of workers, are um, already, I guess, in the situation. But the guy working, the one on the track, off to the side, he didn't choose to sacrifice his life any more than the fat man did, did he? That's true, but he was on the tracks. And you <laughs> this guy was on the bridge. a way of reconciling the reaction of the majority in these two cases. Yeah. Well, I guess um, in the first case where you have the one worker and the five, uh, it's, it's a choice between those two and you have to make a certain choice and people are going to die because of the trolley car, not necessarily because of your direct actions. The trolley car is a runaway thing and then you're making it a split second choice, whereas pushing the fat man over is an actual act of murder on your part. You have control over that, whereas you may not have control over the trolley car. So I think it's a slightly different situation. All right, who has a reply? Is that it? No, that's, that's good. Who has a way? Who wants to reply? Is that a way out of this? Um, I don't think that's a very good reason because you chose to, it's either way you have to choose who dies because you either choose to turn and kill the person, which is an act of conscious thought to turn, or you choose to push the that man over, which is also an active, conscious action. So either way, you're making a choice. Do you want to reply? Well, I'm, I'm not really sure that that's the case. It just still seems kind of different. The act of actually pushing someone over onto the tracks and killing him. You are actually killing him yourself. You're pushing him with your own hands. You're pushing him. And that's right. different than steering something that is going to cause death into another you know, it, it doesn't really sound right saying it now. That's oh, good. I'm up here. What's, no, that's good. What's your name? Andrew. Andrew. Let me ask you this question, Andrew. Yes. Suppose standing on the bridge next to the fat man, I didn't have to push him. Suppose he were standing over a trap door that I could open by turning a steering wheel like that. <laughs> For some reason, that, that still just seems more wrong. Right? I mean, maybe if you accidentally like leaned into the steering wheel or something. <laughs> <like that. laughs> but, uh, or, or say that the car is, is <coughs> hurtling towards a switch that will drop the trap. Um, then, then I can agree right, with fair, that. Fair enough. It still seems wrong in a way that it doesn't seem wrong in the first case to turn. You well, say. And in another way, I mean, in the first situation, you're involved directly with the situation. In the second one, you're an onlooker as well. All right. So you have the choice of becoming involved or not by pushing right. the pattern. Let's, let's Do I give us easy to listen to? Yeah, I use him in my justice course the same way, just little snippets if you're ever interested. He's really a delightful man to listen to, probably the best political philosopher we have. So then I have some questions about this. W what's wrong with this? With these two examples, what's wrong with them? One is believable, one of them isn't. Say what? Unless you feel the moral obligation to, knowing that or thinking that you could possibly save their spot and put all their stuff. Yeah, remember, remember, remember the principle of utility is a moral principle. And the morality is involved, and it's real difficult in either one of these situations. Someone's going to die either way. Go ahead. That's what I was going to say. Neither situation is really avoidable in a sense because, in the end, whether it be one or multiple people are going to end up being killed in that situation, in that scenario. So Someone's going to die. Right, and the young lady's point was either way you're making a choice. 
So as soon as you turn the wheel, to, we call it a spur, then you've chosen an event that you know will take that person's life. Or if you were to push the gentleman off the bridge, then you've chosen to save five lives that way. No, he wasn't giving you that option in the example. He eliminated that. And plus, how are you going to communicate, you know? Like, what do we call that, pantomime or something? And, you know. I'm just saying that, you know, like, the, the, you, know, you, can, you can see the, you can see the second track in that one worker. So why are you going to murder an innocent person who just has to be hanging over the bridge when, you know, that, you know, that driver is trained to do what he's supposed to do? Although we take the spur out so he doesn't have that choice. These are real moral dilemmas, people. I mean, it sounds far-fetched, but this is closer to reality than, than, than you know. We do choose to kill people in this country. It's called capital punishment. And we may well choose to euthanize people, put them out of their mercy at the end of their life on request. That will also be ending someone's life, whether it's going to be murder or killing. There is a legal distinction between the two, but I'll save that for two or three weeks from now. Go ahead. Oh, I thought you were going to say so. Oh, I was. But, um, how could you morally gauge which decision is best? That's a great question. But what does Mill say? The production of the greatest happiness for the greatest number. That's why with the first example, everybody said, well, turn and kill the one. It's in numbers of lives. And, and part, of the, part of it is the worker's responsibility. When you go to work, you accept a certain responsibility. I give a different question. Uh, when we had questions rather than your single essay, you're driving through a tunnel, it's got two lanes, there's a fellow working on a scaffold, and he falls off and if you, and you can't stop. If you stay in your lane, you kill him, or you can pull into a school bus and you'll kill five. What do you do? The reason the, reason the question is, is, is horrible is it's a setup. You don't have a choice. It's the lesser of two evils. You see, the principle of happiness not only promotes happiness, but it says in the promotion of happiness, sometimes you have to deal with promoting unhappiness, and which is the least amount of pain for the least number of people. We can't always choose. We're in our ivory tower. We, we, we make all these decisions. But life doesn't occur in this tower. That's where we come up with our principles. But when we're out there on Jump Street, real life situations occur, and people have decisions to make. And when those decisions require moral judgment, we're asked not to be reckless with our decisions, but that doesn't mean that there's not possible catastrophe on the other end for one as opposed to five. And those things happen out there. You may have never been involved in that. I was driving home one night from, I was down in the village in New York watching a concert and coming home 70 miles an hour on what they call Long Island Expressway. And I mean, bumper to bumper to bumper. And the guy in front of me had no taillights. I didn't know that. Next thing I realized, he was suddenly coming to a quick stop and I was going to rear end him. I looked through my mirror and there's a blind spot. I didn't see a vehicle. So I pulled to the right and I side swapped it. I side swiped an off-duty police officer. Well, you know, I mean, I didn't do harm. It wasn't like I intended to do injury. The guy in front was in violation of just tri basic safety. His, his taillights weren't working. There are consequences. I could have just as easily injured someone, but no intent. Here we introduce intent. Here, I'll give you another one. This, I saw this on Law & Order. It was the second video started to play, and I didn't want you to see that one to make sure we got this one out. <laughs> There's a doctor. There's, there's a story, a doctor, he's got two female patients. This one has got 24 hours to live and needs an organ transplant. This one has got about 48 hours to live and there's nothing anybody medically can do to save her life. Everybody has just said, well, you know, remove life support, you'll, you'll die 48 hours. What is he to do? He's charged with saving life. And he knows that if this lady would just die quicker, her organ would save this lady's life, but she's taken too much time. So now both his patients are going to die. So what does he do? We face this in triage all the time, triage in the military. When you're in combat, you can't save everybody. There are people who are trained to go through the casualties and they get marked red, they're not going to make it. 
this one is going to make it, so we're going to spend our time there. Dr. Sandel gives another example. He'll say you have six people in an auto accident, five are badly hurt, but one is critically hurt. If you spend all your time at the critical one, he will die and the other five will die. What do you do? Well, we, we experience this in wartime in triage. You have to make those kinds of decisions. So this doctor makes this decision. He can't save this woman. She's dying. There's no changing the fact that she's dying. Takes her in the operating room, doesn't want to cause her pain, puts her under a sedative, takes her organ, saves this lady's life. He gets charged with premeditated murder, and he's found guilty. He caused someone's death about 24 hours earlier than it would have happened all by itself. This lady would have died. This lady would have died. There's no good answer. It's a moral dilemma that we do face. Triage, we face it. You're driving down the road, you have a decision to make. It's not a scenario you signed up for. It's going to happen. Look, let, let's hope this never happens. What if a shooter ever comes in this classroom? If everybody does nothing, everybody dies. If somebody does something, maybe not everybody will die. I mean, these are real life situations, people. I'm not speaking this into existence. I hope that never happens, but it has happened on enough occasions to make us pause. People on the airplane, 9-11, into the Pennsylvania field. People made a decision. Now, in that case, it took their life as well. These scenarios, you take someone else's life. Maybe when it takes your life, it's easier to, to justify morally. Well, at least I'm saving, I'm saving other people. And they're not easy. And, and the whole point of this exercise is morality is not meant to be easy. We're spending four weeks going over theory because we need framework. We need, we need this framework right here for the rules of social engagement. But we don't live in rules. We live in the real world. And you bump up against rules, and sometimes the solution is not easy, especially when Mill says, and we use the principle of utility almost all the time, the greatest happiness for the greatest number. But once in a while to do that, we must accept the fact that our actions are going to produce unhappiness or pain or discomfort. What do we do? And it's not enough to have, and we're having it in here like they did with Dr. Sandell in his classroom. We're having a discussion, but you don't live in the classroom. And there are things on the table right now that your generation is going to have to deal with, or these things will deal with you. But either way, they're changing. The whole moral landscape is changing. Just turn on the TV tonight and see if the moral landscape isn't changing. Listen to the news. People are regulating the rules, thinking they're going to do better for more people than not. And people are unhappy. Well, guess what? That's the principle of utility. People are not happy with everything that gets decided. This is the world you live in. We call this a movable feast. You can't control everything, but in the midst of what you can control, you get to make a moral decision, a moral choice. And sometimes that choice is not the easy choice. Sometimes it's just filled with, well, I wish I didn't have to make this decision at all. And that's a good moral realization. But if you do nothing, there are consequences for that doing nothing as well. So what do we do? <clears throat> if you're in my justice course, I don't know if you'll make it there, so I'll share this with you. There's another video he shows. It's a case before this, the, the Court of England. It's called Dudley versus the Queen. The ship, sailing ship days, went out on the ocean, ran into a storm, and the ship sank. Four people survived. There's the captain, Dudley. There's the first mate another crewman, and the young cabin boy. Everybody but the cabin boy has family back in England. The cabin boy's an orphan. He's got no family. 